Bonjour à tous. Welcome everybody. I'll introduce Bourigede in English. Um, so Bourigede uh, just came from the UK. Uh, he got his PhD in Cambridge, uh, working with uh, Vikram Deshpande and Norman Fleck in the Department of Engineering. And then he moved to quickly to Switzerland uh, in Zurich. He worked at ETH and then to California. Uh, and now he's back in the UK and he's going to um, talk of uh, how data science can uh, replace us and help us uh, uh, modeling materials across scales. All right. Thank you very much. It's this, like this? I'd put it to on. Okay, All right. <clears throat> okay, so my topic today is um, multi-scale modeling of materials, um, which is basically a summary of the research that I've been doing. Um, uh, and that concerns how can we basically use data-driven uh, and learning-based method to help address various of problems arised in the uh, 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 um, prob uh, in, in the framework of multi-scale modeling. So I'd like to start with um, a general framework and by basically considering how a mechanical engineer will work uh, every day. So basically, uh, as a mechanical structural engineer, we'll be given an application. So be it like we'll like to design a um, um, bridge frame or design a car body. So to, to fulfill this um, aim or task, uh, we will need to first basically choose a class of material that might have the potential to uh, meet our requirement. For example, if we were to suppose to design for a um, lightweight structures, we might consider composites. And if the task requires that uh, the components should survive high temperature and still provide strength, we might consider metals. But in any case, we need a material system uh, at hand. And afterwards, we need to consider what is the structure that might fulfill our task. For example, uh, and by saying structure, I mean the shape and topology of our engineering designs. And once we have our material and structure at hand, um, we need a third critical uh, rule or map, which is what we call constituent model, which basically bridges my material and my structure. And uh, afterwards, the so-called design is basically a optimization problem uh, where we're trying to maximize our performance uh, at mean time and mean time minimize our cost. So my topic today is basically most of mostly focusing on this constituent model. And of course, this is um, a, a problem has been well studied. Uh, you know, a lot of attention is put in, in this in the history, and we have um, classically a range of models that we have developed to characterize the deformation of different materials. For example, if we were to consider a rubber, we might think of hyperelasticity. If we were to think about metals, then that's plasticity. Uh, there's various version of that. And if you sort of ask, where does this model, constitution model, come from? Well, classically, it comes from experiments. So basically, the way we do this is we postulate the existence of a function form, functional form of the constitution models with unknown parameters that we're going to measure or fit from our from micro scale experiments. You know, you know, for example, to get the Young's modulus, we can just do a simple tension test and and then fit the curve. Uh, and this is the classical way of generating a constitutive model. Then, of course, an alternative way, um, if you don't know how to do experiments like me. Uh, we can do, we can generate this constituent model from a low length scale model. 
uh, basically this consider this microscopic model can then be uh, computed uh, from by looking at uh, lower land scale physics. For example, if we were looking at uh, metals, then uh, we can look at the middle scale crystal plasticity model, and that and using the theory of homogenization, it will then give me the uh, uh, microscopic constitutive model, right? And of course, if you ask where does this lower land scale model come from, of course, um, again, it can come from lower land scale experiments, for example, uh, for to, to, to basically characterize the crystal plasticity, you can think of micropillar experiments uh, for a single grain. Uh, and of course, if you don't like experiments or if you don't have access to it, an alternative way is uh, to even look at an even lower land scale model, where you know you can now start to think about molecular dynamics. And of course, I can do this again and again and, and again, and then we'll go to quantum mechanics and everything is first principle. So basically, uh, this is uh, hopefully just a, a general framework uh, of the so-called multi-scale materials modeling. And my topic is going to basically focus on this graph today. And I'm going to basically look at three uh, 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 challenges that we face in this general framework. So the first challenge is uh, we now have uh, a very nice lower scale uh, understanding of the lower, nice understanding of lower scale physics, uh, where uh, we can sort of come up with high fidelity models, for fidelity models to basically describe and, and simulate this lower land scale physics. However, these models are basically very expensive. And the question to ask is, can we really accelerate the solutions of these lower land scale models? Because by the end of the day, we have, we have to basically pass it through a bunch of land scales in order to find our constituent model. So the second question, uh, or the second challenge uh, uh, associated with this is, as we are moving from scales, uh, we are trying to basically do a huge dimension reduction. And uh, you know, uh, classically, you know, this is done by asymptotic ex expansions, and uh, if your material is complicated or nonlinear, uh, you need have to have a lot of expert judges and guess on the state variables that, that is re related to the uh, uh, microscopic constitutive behavior. And the question to ask is how to really bridge the scales uh, uh, in a general way. Uh, uh, and trying to basically limit the uh, 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 the requirement on this expert judge as much as possible. And the third topic today that I wanted to discuss is how to quantify the uncertainty that arises from this map. For example, you know, in each of these land scale, we will have a chance to generate uncertainties, and of course, it's going to pass uh, from the lowest land scales to the highest land scales. And is there a way to generate, to basically quantify this uncertainty and its propagation? So <clears throat> that's um, the three topics I would like to discuss. Um, let us first start um, with the one where we're trying to accelerate the solution of lower land scale physics. And the motivation is basically um, that, as I said, computational solid mechanics seeks to reduce the number of experiments we need as much as possible by replacing those with high fidelity numerical models. And the key challenge here is that solving, we sort of know, or in, 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 in a lot of uh, circumstances, that these lower land scale physics, but it's just solving them just so expensive. For example, if you're interested in metals and you want to solve a 3D polycrystalline crystal plasticity in the middle scale for an aggregate of about 200 grams, it might take your one to two days for computing, computing those in, the, in today's high performance computing, uh, compute, computing systems. Or if you are then even interested in, you know, lower, even lower land scale, you want to model the motion of, you know, discrete dislocations and how they interact with inclusions and, bound, and grain boundaries, then that can easily take one to two months uh, to finish just simple one single calculation. And really, the motivation here is to ask, you know, can data science help with this? Um, uh, with this, 
uh, and uh, the answer is yes, and we've tried to look at it. But before I go to uh, the details, I'd just like to have uh, take a step back and let us look at the bigger pictures. So throughout the years, we have of course discovered a range of uh, numerical or you know theoretical models, and we can solve them numerically uh, across in each individual land scales. And the, the mathematical theory that unifies them is, of course, partial differential equations. And for example, if we were interested in continuums, um, interested in like macro scale um, uh, deformation, failure of both solids, then that is basically a wave type of equation if you consider dynamics. And of course, if we're interested in the middle scale physics, we're interested in the phase field, that's a kind of a, vari a variation of diffusion equations type of PDEs. And of course, if we're interested in like, you know, uh, molecular dynamics, that's Langevin dynamics, and that's basic stochastic differential equation, which you basically add a probability measure in your uh, part, the PDE descriptions. So uh, now the idea uh, that we use to solve, of course, to, to solve this problem classically is that we're trying to solve the partial differential equation. and in the general cases where we can't come up with analytic solutions, uh, we solve it numerically. And the way we solve it numerically is we can use either, for example, numerical solvers such as finite element, or there are recently uh, uh, methods developed called physics informed neural networks. So basically, the, the basic idea is that we're going to come up with a parameterized approximation of my solution field. And uh, if it's finite element, we use polynomials. If it's physics informed neural network, we use neural networks. But essential, essentially, they are the same. Uh, same idea. And then we plug this to our weak formulation. Uh, and then we just solve uh, a system of usually um, transfer a PDE problem to a system of linear equations where we know how to solve. So that's basically the classical way that we solve partial differential equations. Now, uh, it has an advantage in the sense, in the sense that what, if the problem is well defined, well posed, there's a way to show uh, 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 existence and of the solution, and then there's a way to show the rate of convergence. However, the uh, drawback is that if I now think that I want to change my PD uh, coefficient, for example, I want to change uh, my materials physically, that means that I change the coefficient parameterization of my uh, 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 one of the uh, differential equation here, I would need to go through this process again, just resolve it in order for us to get a solution. And similarly, if I change my boundary conditions or I change my initial conditions, I need to go through this again, so just solve it again. So, and of course another kind of uh, drawbacks is that we need to require, we need to know the physics, we need to have the explicit knowledge about the functional form, about the form of the governing equations. Now, so uh, what we are proposing is an alternative approach where we call that we want to try to learn the PD. So by mean, what we, I, when I say we try to learn a PD, what I meant is that we consider the solution of the partial differential equation as a solution operator that maps uh, a space of interest, which can be this E, can be the coefficients of the PD partial differential equations, uh, or it can be the different boundary or initial conditions. And we want to basically uh, uh, consider the, the solution operator that maps E to my true solution U. And we want to do this in a data-driven manner, and that means that we will be given a set of data, Cn and Un, where Cn is drawn from E, and Un is, can be computed by some underlying true, true, uh, true solution operator side dagger on Cn. And we want to come up with an approximation of this solution operator that, uh, which is parameterized by some theta, such that um, uh, there exists a theta star, which is this optimized parameterization, such as psi 
parameterized by theta star will give me approximately the side dagger. <coughs> and that is basically the key idea of learning partial differential equations. And of course, we wanted to uh, do this uh, parameterization, uh, but sorry, do this approximation using neural networks. <coughs> and uh, uh, the benefit of doing this way is suppose I only need to basically train my neural network to approximate this side dagger. And once I train my neural network, uh, I, and suppose I now wanted to change uh, my PD coefficients or boundary conditions, I can just do it. I can just uh, you know run it through once. I don't need to basically solve it again because I've learned this operator. Uh, and we can show uh, uh, the uh, uh, arrow that the arrow is bounded actually. Um, uh, in fact, that suppose uh, if your uh, uh, input Cn is drawn from the same probability measure that you use to generate uh, the uh, training data set. All right. So, uh, but before I go into give you some detailed examples on what we have done in this kind of uh, uh, field, I'd like to just give you a brief kind of introduction on what is deep learning and deep neural networks in general. So there has been various of a lot of um, interest in recent years on these uh, neural networks. Uh, but if we look at its mathematical structure, it's kind of very simple. So basically, uh, neural networks consider input from finite dimensional Euclidean spaces or ve finite dimensional vectors. So we, we have V and U, two vectors. So in order to approx the neural networks, uh, what neural networks does is that it applies first a global linear affine transformation to my V, which is my input vector. And afterwards, we apply a local nonlinearity, uh, which can be the hyperbolic tangent, sigmoid, or ReLU, which is shown to be very successful. Uh, and then the combination of this global and linear, uh, sorry, the global and local operator is called a layer of the neural network. And so-called uh, deep neural network or deep learning is basically we just compose this global and local uh, operators again and again and again so that we increase the, the length uh, or the depth of my neural network. And the so-called training is basically our optimization procedure where we're trying to minimize the loss function, which measures the distance between the neural network prediction U and the data you had um, and optimize uh, with the, the parameters, uh, parameterization A and B, right? So this is just you know, a simple mathematical structure of deep neural networks. And it seems like the way that neural networks construct approximators is very efficient, surprisingly expressive, because this is kind of known to us because we've, do, we've done this in finite element a lot, but in FEM, Rather than doing the, this way composing operators, what we do is we just approximation our field by additions. But, uh, but what is surprising to us is that, you know, doing composition of functions seems to be a much more efficient way um, in terms of uh, uh, building the approximators. And the, the key driving force, um, and, and this is basically the key motivation of our a work is we're asking our, ourselves this question, can we extend the idea, right? So basically, so basically this neural networks, uh, it is, has a nice structure, but works on uh, a finite dimensional Euclidean spaces, which means that you are inevitably mesh dependent, meaning that if I train V and U at a certain resolution, I can't, and I have data which is, has a finer or coarser resolution, I can't just use it. So, <coughs> And that is basically the key uh, idea that we have, is that we want to basically generalize, generalize this thing in function spaces. And we come, actually come up with, with a name, we call it neural operators. And the architecture we come up with is kind of a direct extension of the neural network architecture. So the idea is that if we look at the building blocks of a neural network, um, you can see that 
The key thing here is the global linear fine transformation, where zi is just aig vg plus bj. So a direct extension of that is that we can basically extend <coughs> this uh, linear fine transformation into a global linear integral transformation. Basically, what I'm saying is I'm now going to replace this AIJ operator uh, by a convolution kernel, Ki theta, which is now this is the parameter which we're going to learn through the gradient descent or optimization procedure. And <coughs> again, and afterwards, we'll, again, we apply uh, similar local nonlinearity and do the same kind of uh, um, operator composing exercise, uh, we get our pro approximation. So this is basically the key idea behind neural operators. Now, of course, there's a, a you know, hundreds of ways where, you know, in terms of how you can construct a, a, a this kernel, you, you know, uh, and um, we have come up with a number of uh, um, uh, ideas. So well, we have this graph neural operator, we have this multipole graph neural operator, we have low rank neural operator. Um, but um, the one that seems to be work best for partial differential equations is uh, this thing called Fourier neural operator. Now the idea of Fourier neural operator is um, uh, basically very simple. So um, again, we basically trying to approximate that convolution um, kernel there. The way we do it is that we notice that Convolution in the real domain is equivalent to and uh, to basically a element-wise multiplication in the Fourier domain, right? And in that regard, what we're doing here is we're, we're replacing the classical uh, global linear fine transformation using what we call Fourier layer. What we do is giving our input, we first apply a pseudo-spectral Fourier projection, basically Fourier transform, uh, you know, fast Fourier transformation. Uh, into the uh, uh, Fourier domain, and then we construct our kernel, uh, uh, which is to be learned in the Fourier domain, um, and we then afterwards we just uh, do a inverse Fourier transform, and this basically uh, gives one layer of uh, of my Fourier neural operator, and then we do the classical, you know, non-local thing, and compose everything, and that gives me the uh, for a neural operator. So we have done this, and we've tried this for a neural operator to a number of partial differential equations. And this one I'm showing you is the application of this for a neural operator to a two dimensional near Stokes equations, where we're basically looking at the uh, vorticity streamline formulations of near Stokes. And we're trying to basically construct neural operator that. Um, can propagate the initial vortex uh, condition uh, uh, through uh, <coughs> uh, certain uh, lengths in time. And these columns shows the numerical solver as uh, result. And this column shows the Fourier neural operators, operators prediction. So once trend, so the, I'm going to emphasize that um, these are not seen by the neural operators in the training data, but these are something that are uh, only accessible uh, uh, from the test, so we're using this to test what we have learned. And it seems that it works pretty well. And what is important here is that suppose I now compare the time that it requires for us to basically solve this using a new micro solver and to, to uh, the time that required by a Fourier neural operator, you can see that um, the Fourier neural operator is approximately 1,000 times faster than traditional solvers. And that is basically what we mean by we're trying to accelerate the speed of the solution. And um, we also tried this to a bunch of other uh, PDEs. So we tried this on Burgers equation, which is like basic, and also basic Darcy flow, the scalar kind of equation. And uh, we compared our architecture to the other popular architectures in our field. And we found that um, indeed that the Fourier neural operator uh, always gives, gives us a lower arrow. In, when we test it, and also the additional benefit of constructing this function space learning method is that you get zero strut super resolution, meaning that I only need to train my neural network at a specific uh, resolution, and afterwards I can just use it 
uh, on a finer mesh or coarse, coarse mesh without the requirement to retrain it, basically. Uh, so <coughs> this is basically hopefully give you a kind of a quick a general overview of what is neural operators. And let's now move to our second uh, um, uh, topic, which is on learning the bridging. Um, how do we basically bridge skills? And the key question to ask here is, you know, uh, what information should we path uh, throughout this land skills um, as it is a graded dimension reduction procedure? And I'd like to start with a classical 1D problem, um, which we know everything. So let us picture a 2D, one-dimensional two-phase composites. So uh, where each, where we have one and two. So basically, two, uh, uh, two uh, piecewise constant uh, field, and <coughs> we have our micromechanical problem defined here. Um, these are all typical, but what is, what I want to emphasize is the uh, micro mechanical in the local uh, material model is Markovian in the sense that my local stress is only a function at time t, is only, only a function of my strain at time t and my strain rate at time t. So there's no memory, no path dependency. And of course, um, um, we have a piecewise constant stiffness and the viscosity field which is defined um, like, like that. And because this is just a simple 1D problem, we know the explicit solution of this. And you can show that when you apply the theory of homogenization, we know that the microscopic stresses um, is, can be computed uh, by something very similar to my micromechanical material model. So we need, again, an elastic part, which has a counterpart in the uh, micromechanical model, we have a viscoelastic part, which again resembles the thing here. However, you can see that the, 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 the minute we apply homogenization and we move to a higher land scale, we will then introduce some memory fact. And in this particular case, even though that our micromechanical model is totally, totally Markovian, this, this, the homogenized or microscopic model is not Markovian anymore and you in fact has a convolution that requires you to convolve your boundary condition or microscopic stress, uh, strength uh, with the term with the kernel here, right? So, and that is basically the key, one of the key challenges in applying the homogenization theory in the sense that even though my micro-mechanical model is um, time independent or path independent, there's no guarantee that my microscopic model is time independent or path independent at all. And therefore it forces us, so suppose we're trying to learn an operator um, that represents my microscopic constitutive behavior, then our choice is that we have to take all the history information into account, into my input, and trying to map that to my output. Right? So, now of course we don't like to do this because again, this is an infinite dimensional problem. Um, the classical way of resolving this is state or variable internal variable theory introduced by, um, you know, this is what they use in thermodynamics. Um, it's introduced by Ansaga in 1931 and now becomes a basis of modeling elastic material behaviors in our field. Um, and the idea is basically that if I look at this convolution um, uh, operation here, if I write this whole thing as state variable, then you can see that there is a, because of the special form of this, there exists a very simple first order differential equation, evolution equation, that governs the evolution of this C. So therefore, I can turn this uh, non Markovian or path dependent problem into a Markovian one if I extend my input space and add a state variable C here. Basically, I'm making my input space a bit more high, uh, you know, increase my, the dimension of my input space by one. I can then turn a, you know, path dependent problem to a path independent one. And of course, that's um, uh, 
And the thing that we usually use, this C, uh, is normally called a state variable, and it's supposed to characterize the evolution of the microstructure of the material. And of course, there are a lot of criticisms about this approach. So one is that this is a sort of a phenomenal logical approach. The choice of our internal variables is often ad hoc, so they choose when needed. And there's no notion of convergence, meaning that we don't know how many state, wo state variables we will need to describe our micro-mechanical systems in a macro scale. And we don't know whether we have used too few or too much. Right? So that, that's the, the state variables basically come from expert judge. And so that is actually our motivation, uh, where we developed the so-called recurrent neural network. It's basically a direct extension of the state internal variable theory, where we say, OK, so um, we're trying to approximate this uh, non markovian or path-dependent operator side dagger using two neural networks. So one is this G of neural, 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 neural operator, actually, uh, where <coughs> it takes uh, in, in, the, in the problem of 1D elastic, viscal elasticity, it takes the strain, the uh, hypothesized, uh, a, you know, assumed state variable, C, and the time, at current time T, with the parameterization, and it maps to the um, first uh, time derivative of C. And then we have another neural operator that maps, that takes the, again, the strain, state variable, and, ti uh, and time, and maps to, the, to my microscopic output of sigma. And therefore, what we're hoping is that by include a internal variable C, which we don't make any assumptions on it, but the, but the only assum uh, particular assumption on the functional form of how this C evolves, the only assumption that we are assuming is that there, ex there exists a finite number of Cs um, that we can use to reconstruct this side dagger using uh, from this formulation. And the other kind of uh, assume, assumption we made is that we assume that it starts from zero for now. And uh, afterwards, we're just applying this, the standard supervised learning framework on it. And we were asking our two quest ourselves two questions. So the first is, can we find the minimal number of DXC, basically the dimension of this DXC, uh, for the state variables from data, meaning that, that that means that are there a minimal a minimal dimension for the physical problems where we can have uh, the minimal number of cases to represent the memory or past dependency of my micro mechanical problem, and also we ask ourselves the question: Can we actually learn the hidden dynamics, basically the evolution of the state variables from data? And we applied this kind of idea to this uh, one-dimensional viscoelastic beam problem. Now uh, we generalize it to L phases. And <laughs> there's a nice theory that we have proved that um, you can prove that there exists a exa an exact parameterization where if you have L phases, L different phases in your 1D bar model, sorry, <clears throat> then you will basically need L minus one state variable. So basically, you need L minus one Cs to basically um, um, exactly reparameterize the side dagger, which is the true uh, operator of interest. So we've applied this um, uh, this our recurrent neural operator to a three-phase material, and what if we have? And then we look at. Uh, um, what happens if we gradually increase the dimension of my hidden space, and then we compare our test arrow, and you can see that if I don't include any hidden state variables, there's no way that this model can explain all the physics from the data. So therefore, we have a very large test arrow. The minute I apply one state variable, meaning that increase the hidden dimension by one, I significantly re reduce the, the test arrow, and the minute I increase this to two, my test arrow now becomes um, a, a sort of near minimal. And afterwards, even if I increase to 10, there's no significant changes in my test arrow. And that basically suggests that I probably just need two state variables 
to describe the physics in my data, and that is some, somehow kind of corresponds to this theorem. Tells me because I have three phase, that means that I need two state variables. And <coughs> uh, what's more interesting is when we look at the evolution of the state variables, because for this nice kind of simple 1D case, we know how these state variables are going to evolve. And if we, we compute the evolutions uh, for different loading cases and compare the new network approximations, which is the dotted line, and the truth one, which is the which is the analytical solution, we see that it is indeed, it seems to be able to find, to learn the true hidden dynamics directly from data. And we sort of tried to also test this kind of idea to a more challenging problem involves crystal plasticity. And this is the crystal plasticity micromechanical model we used. It's kind of a, it's a uh, relatively complicated, uh, you know, micromechanical uh, boundary value problem we have. Um, um, but um, just to uh, give you a quick uh, uh, summarize, uh, we uh, my, this problem micromechanically is uh, not Markovian. It has past dependent dependence itself, and micromechanically we need four sets of internal variables at each micromechanical points to represent the history, and that um, uh, you know those uh, internal variables include the grain orientation, basically, um, you know um, how does this each of grain oriented, and we need inelastic strands, uh, because this, this model considers both um, plasticity and something called tuning. It's a, another um, uh, thing that you can find in your grains, in your of metals. <coughs> and then you have something to restore, uh, to basically record the amount of plastic slip, slip ha plasticity happens, we call it slip systems. And you have a, a, a set of variables that you have to use to record how much train has happened in your system. So basically, it's kind of a, a, a quite complicated model in the micro scale. And we sort of tried um, our recurrent operator on the homogenization of this problem. And what we found is that in two dimensional uh, crystal plasticity, uh, we only need with a random initial texture, meaning that with uh, um, with grains randomly oriented at the beginning, we only need two state variables for this. And if I plot the neural network uh, approximation and the numerical so solver, which we use fast Fourier transform to solve it, we see that you know it agrees quite well, nicely, uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, numerical model. And we also see that the effect of, again, building a neural operator in the sense that we sort of achieve a, you know, a one shot, super, a zero, one, uh, sorry, zero shot super resolution, meaning that we are trained here and are tested with different resolution now in time. You can see that my error is much more benign compared to the one that I train a classical recurrent neural network, which is a, a version where of neural networks where it doesn't have this operator structure. So, uh, and of course, um, this uh, result is generalizable, and we can test, we train it with sort of random passes like this, and we can test it uh, with uh, 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 loadings from a different probability measure. And it seems that it's it, it still sort of works, and you can see that this is testing, this is testing them in simple tension. This is uh, tension compression, and this is cavity expansion. So in you know, all these cases, um, kind of work nicely. And um, I'd like to also just show you, oh, sorry, show you a result where we use this uh, in the multi-scale modeling, so now I'm showing you a macroscopic calculations where each point here has a corresponding micro-mechanical boundary value problem defined like this, and we, so we solve this basically using the recurrent neural operator, and that is what we get. Um, and what we have found for this particular case is that compared to the um, uh, uh, the, the classical multi-scale modeling method called 
a computational homogenization method called Fe square, uh, we are actually 10 to the 6 faster than that. So this is really fast and allows us to conduct uh, large calculations, uh, uh, large scale calculations, which is unthinkable uh, if you don't have these neural network surrogates. Uh, and that brings me to the, uh, and this brings me to the last topic uh, that I would want to share with you is on the UQ part. So basically the key consideration is how can we quantify the propagation of uncertainties throughout different land scales in this general framework. And the idea behind it um, is really speaking is again to, to think material responses as input out maps. So, so uh, we think that there is a map um, that maps my material properties x1 and xn, which itself is uncertain, um, to my design or outcome y. So we're basically providing some mathematical, mathematical abstractions of the problem <coughs> that, that in, at hand. And we're interested in the, the uncertainty quantification and uh, really the question to ask there is suppose I have uncertainties in my, you know, one of my lower land scale physics variables x, how would that affect the global outcomes of my performance or design y, right? So, and remember that that x has to be propagated uh, across a bunch of land scales to reach this. Uh, now, the, the key concern here is that, yes, we can do a sort of sensitivity type analysis on this. However, it would be way too expensive if we wish to solve this um, uh, 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 in, in a brute force manner because I have to basically compose all my physical uh, 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 solvers or, or operators throughout this land scale and just to evaluate this. So that might be too expensive or in some in certain cases not possible. So what we would like to do is we like to basically impose the fact that there exists separation of land scales throughout um, uh, when we move from low land scales to higher land scales. Therefore, it is basically possible to decompose Oops, sorry. So there, it, it is actually possible to decompose my global response functions into sub-maps or subsystems where I can focus on one, uh, 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 you know, one pair of subscales at one time, and then do do the uncertainty quantification in a sequential manner, so that um, I can just gradually move from my lowest land scale to the highest land scale where a divide and conquer manner, and I, I shall explain in a minute. And the other key concern here is that um, we, in the classical way of doing uncertainty quantifications, uh, people are mostly considering the Bayesian way of doing things, Bayesian method. Um, the, the key kind of critics for Bayesian method is that you would always need a prior, meaning that you need some kind of a prior assumption or description of your inputs. However, in engineering, this is not always guaranteed. We don't always know how our uncertainty sources, you know, what would be the probably measures we can impose on top of it. So in our formulation, we're trying to basically avoid that. So basically, we're trying to say that are there a way that we don't, do not need to specify a problem, probability measure on these kind of variables? Rather, can we just provide some bounds on this, on my uncertainties and still be able to predict or bound the prob probability of failure? Uh, it turned out that it can, and the, the, there's a nice theorem from McDiarmid uh, where it predicts that it actually provides upper bound of prob probability of failure and it tells us that the way that you can do it is you look at the so-called diameter uh, in the McDiamine uh, inequality, which is basically quantifies the maximum changes that um, your output can get by changing this, uh, by varying my input. Uh, and we have shown that, actually speaking, if we follow this direction, then there's a nice way of decompose the global response function into sub 
systems. And the way to do that is actually using the idea of model of continuity. And we have a theorem that we proved, uh, not we, I didn't prove it, but some other pr pr proved it, that you can basically say, uh, you can basically state that um, if you use a mod model of continuity concept, then you can decompose a, 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 a composed operator Fm composed with Fn by first considering calculating the model, model of continuity on Fn and then apply it to Fm. And then there's a way to basically convert the model of continuity to the diameter in the McDiamine inequality and that, that fits um, and then fits nicely to the uh, McDiamine inequality which gives us a, a, an upper bound on our arrows. And so the key idea here again is that we're trying to basically uh, decompose this uh, operator so that we can just do it sequentially one by one. And we have applied this uh, uh, kind of idea to a problem where we consider the multiscale impact of a magnesium plate. So here I have a rigid ball impacting a magnesium plate and I consider three scales. So one is the macro scale, which we have the plate deform. And the other is this um, meso scale, where I have a bunch of uh, polycrystallines working here. Uh, uh, we consider approx uh, the, the aggregate deformation of approximately 128 polycrystal uh, um, polycrystalline uh, grains. And I have this micro scale where we consider single grain physics. And in fact, in this problem, we consider that we have uncertainties in our single crystal, crystal uh, critical resolve yield stresses. This is basically something about associated with the plasticity of each single grains. And we ask ourselves the question, you know, how does this uh, micro, micro scale uncertainties uh, will propagate throughout this landscape to the microscopic. Um, how would that a change in here affect the change in our microscopic ballistic performance? Um, we have run through our calculations and we say that, okay, suppose I now have uncertainties in my single grain slip systems and here are there. Again, we don't assume any probability measures on this uncertainties, rather we say that they are just bounded on some intervals. And we're able to, using the method we have, framework we have developed, we're able to basically quantify the total uncertainty, which is again an upper bound on the total uncertainty of the back face deflection, which is a way of measuring the performance of the in the ballistic impact problems. And in addition to that, thanks to the way that we decompose the problem, it is, basic, it is also possible to basically ranking the effect of the basic the propag propagation of uh, uncertainties throughout these land scales. For example, this is how the, pro the uncertainties, uncertainties will propagate through from micro to meso. And this model of continuity you can think of is an effect of uh, how much um, each uh, mi uh, micro features will affect meso features. And similarly, uh, we can construct another map which ranking the effect of micro scale uncertainties to the macro scale, basically the global performance. And we're saying that here, it seems like the, the uncertain uncertainties on pyramidal slip, which is a single grain feature again, affects mostly our uh, structural level uncertainty. And with this, uh, I'd just like to stop and just give a summary of my talk today. So I'm basically considering, considering the general framework for multi-scale material and structure by design. <coughs> and I've shown that um, it is indeed possible to accelerate the solution of partial differ differential equations using Fourier neural operators that we have come up with. And we were considering how you know, we can efficiently bridge in between scales. Uh, we have come up with this recurrent neural operator, which closely resembles the theory of internal variables. <coughs> and it is also possible to identify and show convergence of internal state variables um, and learn their true hidden physics. And in addition, 
I have discussed briefly about how we can quantify um, the uncertainty throughout different land scales, and we have proposed this hierarchical un uncertainty quantification method where we do not rely on the, <coughs> um, we, don't, we do not require a assumption on the prior distributions, rather we'll be able to provide bounds, uh, that bounds, uh, that gives us uh, some indication on the uncertainty of the global design. And with this, I will stop my talk here. Uh, here's uh, the references I used for this talk, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Borigede. <coughs> uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Yes, Sebastian. Can you go back to the the example you showed where there was a, something impacting a plate and you were comparing your neural operator to uh, yeah. Fe square? Yeah. In this, so it's a ballistic example. Yeah. There, there is a, uh, and you've trained your uh, neural uh, network. Yeah. If you change the thickness of the plate, yeah. do you have to retrain no. your network? No. If you change the speed of the, no. if you change the shape of the, no. you can change, <laughs> yeah. you can change the shape without yeah, retraining. We, yeah. The reason is because we are using the two scale, you know, approx the like expansion, like um, and we're we're saying that we're learning the micro mechanical boundary value problems using a neural network, and then we basically uh, plug that in our micro scale. So the theory of homogenization tells us that we can split uh, the global PD to a micro scale one and a micro scale mm -hmm. one. The one that we are learning is a micro scale partial boundary value problem and we can okay. just plug into the microscope. And, and you've, you've used uh, von Mises' uh, plasticity theory. If you change it, do you have to retrain your network? Oh, no, no, no. There's no von Mises anything There's here. No I'm plasticity showing the Mises here. stress here. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I do not assume any form of plasticity, oh. not, not, any, not any of them. The new operator is trained from data, which it, it has a functional form like this. So there's no concept of plasticity or anything I need. I find I'm, I'm able to basically recover the plastic state variables from this. Uh, if you're interested, I have a paper discussing this. So basically, if I apply this, um, there's a way that you can identify the plastic strains and their evolutions from data without telling the neural network that. And so in that regard, you know, we don't have that, what, that, that's what I mean by expert judges. You know, the plastic strand is something that we kind of observed from the Mises plasticity as well. It's something we observe from experiment. We make assumptions on the existence of plastic strands and how it evolves, yield surface and all that. But then in this kind of approach, I don't need any of this. All I need is that I assume that the, my, my micro-mechanical st structure uh, boundary value problem can be approximated using a finite number of state variables. And there exists a evolution law of the state variables that will give me uh, that will give me the uh, 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 the uh, approximation of the true map, which can be uh, homogenized, you know, in Mark scale more misses or something. But we don't have any, you know, requirement on that. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Always um, about the very same problem on which. Uh, it was asked before of the impact ballistic uh, object impacting against a plate. Could you show us the video, please, again? The basin? Uh, the the video that you showed before, just before for the for the oh, previous question. The impact, the impact, impact. please, the okay, ballistic okay, one. It. So, if I understand well, um, um, it's a very naive question. If I understand well, yeah. you got uh, a neural network-like problem that is solved within each cell. Yeah. What's the influence of the size of the cell? Oh. Between in the ratio between the size of the object and the size of the cell, and is that independent on the size of the problem? Yeah. So and have you, do you have to train it afterwards no. if it changes? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Wow, that's a great question. So, wow. First, first answer is um, we assume that there exists a separate separation of land scales, meaning that 
uh, the, the, actually the, the dimension of the cell doesn't matter that much because my micro mechanical problem exists in, uh, basically in the homogenization limit, meaning that you know the, the, the ratio between my uh, 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 micro mechanical boundary value problem, the unit cell there or the unit torus there to the to this lens is near zero. So that's why I don't quantify the effect size effect there. And I think your question is great in the sense that suppose we don't have separation of land scales, meaning that, and, and in that regard, um, uh, we, I think we would then basically need to consider <coughs> the size of our uh, uh, boundary value problems and the geometry of that, then all, everything, everything considered that has to be considered. We're, trying, we're working on this right now and we have paper uh, which kind of including the geometric effect where we are we're trying to learn the mapping from the domain or the support of our PD to our solution. That is doable, uh, uh, but that is uh, a, 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 pro a work which is uh, in current process. Right. Yes. Uh, well, th uh, thank you very much for this uh, interesting talk. I'm very intrigued by all these approaches. Thank so you. I have. <clears throat> Because you mentioned a few challenges uh, that you have attacked, uh, I have maybe one question, and if you accept, one extra challenge. Oh, sure. Um, okay. So the question is from the perspective of the approach. You say, uh, to reduce the number of experiments that uh, are run, we produce high fidelity numerical models. Yes. Um, in the example that you give of the one-dimensional bar, or also in the statement of your um, approach, it seems that somehow you always need to rely or know a ground, uh, sort of an underlying model that you need to sort of rely upon. Yeah. And so maybe I have a question that is general. Uh, when you introduce this mapping from the input to the output, yep. which somehow, in my understanding, represents the response of a system during an evolution. Do you have any general understanding of what type of uh, evolutions or what type of processes, what type of properties this operator has, what type of phenomena that you are able to capture in a general sense? And uh, yes or no, I would to propose the challenge to do one of these uh, training exercises. But starting just from data, I give you data, and together we try to understand what's behind, without somehow you even knowing my name, so what I do or where I study. I think uh, that's a great question, and that's regarding, so, okay, maybe we, I, I can quickly go back to here to answer your question. Uh, Right. So, if you see that, uh, uh, first of all, the, the, the architecture and the, the way that we're generating in terms of new operators, it can be purely data driven, meaning that I don't need to know anything about the Gartner equations, physics here. You give me data, I will be trying to find a, find a solution operator that approximates the solution. Um, that maps the my input and output, which basically satisfies the underlying um, the underlying side dagger, which is where your PD knowledge is built in. I don't need to explicitly know that. I can find it from data, and an example of this is where I show this recurrent neural operator. So where, for example. I don't know where, sorry, one sec, here, right? So I don't know anything about the, um, in this case, the ODE that governs the evolution of this C dot, but I can somehow recover that from data. And that is uh, something called unsupervised learning procedure. And in this case, it's a, semi-unsupervised in the sense that although I don't uh, <coughs> um, assume the functional form of the evolution law, I have access to my 
input and output uh, uh, pairs, which is my stress and strain. So in the sense that, you know, it's, uh, and just to answer the question, if you only give me data, I can apply our data-driven framework and trying to approximate the underlying solution operator side dagger. And on the other extreme, if I have zero data and I only have PDE knowledges, then you can basically solve uh, using, using the uh, uh, Fourier neural operator or just the uh, neural networks in your approximation of the field and you just do solve your PDs like that. Um, and that's basically give you a classical solution. And when we have a combination that we know some physics, but we have some data, then we can also combine these two approaches where we basically, under the, 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 the standard method, um, we call it full physics informed neural operator, but the standard method is basically, we're basically building the knowledge from data and the partial differential equation in our loss functions, right? And we're trying to minimize a combination of that, which trying to find the balance between my PDE knowledge and my data. I don't know if that solves your answer. I, I think that challenge has been solved because this is exactly what I have been doing here. Yeah. Lipschitz. Lipschitz. Okay, um, I think we we'll invite Andres uh, to lunch. So, and uh, <laughs> thank you for listening, and uh, let's thanks Borigede again. Thank you. And Borigede will be here this afternoon. So.